a great privilege, and I do bless God for all of you, for the lovely singing, the lovely word to the children, the lovely message from the song that we all love so much and burned into our hearts. It's a great joy for me to be with a very godly man and a tremendous privilege to see how God can honor a family and be with a family as this family. So I am so grateful to be in your home, brother, to meet your children, your godly wife, and the lovely ministers that serve alongside of you. And it's a tremendous joy to be here with you this morning, just to sense God with you, to hear the men praying as they did before the service. That was a privilege in itself. And the way you sing everything, even this lovely message in song by these godly young people and family, I do bless the Lord to be here. And I thank God for the privilege of bringing my wife. For 17 years, for 18 years, she never left our home. She was always there when I left her, and she never left the children. This is the first time she's come to your land, and it took quite something to make her to come. But I'm glad she came. I'm glad she came particularly the first time to your land, to this church, and to you very lovely people. So thank you that I can be here. I've been looking forward to coming. I thank God for the man you've spoken of, Keller de Toy, and I've worked with him in Canada quite a lot, gone across that lovely land, and I'm so glad now that through his friendship I've met you dear people. Can we all have a short prayer? Can we bow before God for a short prayer, please? Our Father, we praise thee for the word of God. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And we look to the Holy Spirit to make this word that God has given to man alive. Come, thou Spirit of God, and speak through the word of God by illuminating it into our hearts. Keep us under the blood of Jesus Christ, safe from the powers of darkness, and in mercy come visit us this day, this hour, with thy presence and with thy voice speaking to the depth of our hearts. Come, Lord, in mercy stand beside me in this pulpit and speak through me. We all ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, God, Saviour, and our dearest friend. Amen. In the Holy Bible, there are many passages which we come to love above other passages, if that's possible. And one passage, all of God's people, who begin to walk with God and go through with God and get understanding of what it is to walk with God in truth. One passage that all of us slow down at and all of us come to love is John 15, where the dear Lord Jesus speaks these words, I am the true vine. He calls himself a vine. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman, the keeper of the vineyard, the one who tends and works in the vineyard. I am the true vine. My father, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me. Now suddenly he looks at you and I. Suddenly he points to us, to you and me, and he calls us branches. He calls us branches. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, that beareth not fruit. Is that you? Young man? Is that you, lady, that Christ suddenly looks at? And I believe with a broken heart would say this about anyone sitting here today. No fruit. Oh, I can't think of anything more tragic that God could ever say about my life. I can't think of anything I would hate more that God would ever say this of me. Does he say it of you? As he looks at you, 
every branch in me that beareth not fruit. What tragic words. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He taketh away. Now, I don't know what that means. I'm a preacher. I've preached in ministers' conferences where there are hundreds and hundreds of ministers who preach from the Word of God. And I have said to them, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. So all I'm going to do today is leave it between you and God. I won't preach on it. Forgive me, I can't. But I leave it between you and your God who said these words. Just you. You work it out what God means, please. If this is what God says of your life, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit. Now suddenly, he looks at you and I who are vitally real with God. You and I who he can write across our lives the words of Second Corinthians 5 verse 17 without any shadow of a doubt. If any man be in Christ, he says, any one of you sitting in this building, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Look, God says, to the whole world. All things have become new. There's fruit. You're real. You're vital with God. He can say to your enemy, look. All things have become new in this man's life. And your enemy won't have one word to argue as God speaks to him louder than any preacher ever spoke from a pulpit to one life. And no man can argue. All things became new. Oh, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit is reality, is life. He can say to the whole world, to your wife, to your children, to your father and mother, there's fruit. No one can mistake it. No one will argue with God. No one will not recognize it. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, what does he do with us? He purgeth it. Not one month after you come to God, the moment there's life, the moment he sees you real, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit, God says. That it may bring forth more fruit. The moment you really save, the moment there's vital reality in your life, God says he purges it. God says. Now that's not a popular message. That's something you won't hear much in the pulpit of God anywhere in the world today because people will run. He purges it. That word, some of the new translations that they bring out say the word means cleanseth it. The moment there's light, he cleanseth. But that's not true. There's only one true translation of any of the originals that will bring out any true meaning to what Christ said. It's a cutting word. There's something that hurts. Can God be saying that to you and me? Does God say that in the Bible? The moment I'm real, the moment I've turned in truth, the world can see I'm real. Say, is something going to hurt? He cut. There's something of a, a pain, a wound about to come. Is this God that would do this to man who gives his life to him? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. 
It's not a popular message. Today, you hear people crying out prosperity preaching. Loud and clear, come to Christ and you're prosper, sir. No wonder they come to Christ. Who wouldn't want to prosper? Come to Christ, you'll have no difficulties financially, they cry out. You'll never suffer. You won't have persecutions. You won't ever suffer physically. You won't have any sorrows or wounds as well as physical. Come to Christ, we pray for you. If you're sick, they say, you'll be healed. If you're not healed, it's sin in your life or unbelief, they say. Come to Christ, it's heaven and earth. But beloved, that's not the truth. That's a lie. When these poor people come to Christ in their difficulties and find they're not prospering, then they become bitter in their millions against God and Christianity. And they find they're not healed, they're bitter. And things go wrong. And we need to cry it out loud and long, loud and clear. There's no such a thing as heaven on earth. Heaven is coming. But in this world you shall have tribulation. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There is so much crying out of that which will be hard. It is about to come on us when there is vital reality in our lives. That God allows that it may bring forth more fruit. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it. Immediately, he purges it in his perfect wisdom, in his perfect love, in his perfect longing for the best. The best. No wasting of time here. There's no time to waste. He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. You go to the vineyard. You and I who are perhaps ignorant of vineyards, you watch the keeper of the vineyard, the worker, and what he does to the branches on the vine. There's a ruthlessness that you and I would stand back stunned, literally stunned. He will not spare anything that shouldn't be there, cutting, cutting, anything that shouldn't be there. There's no wasting time that he can work, cutting, cut. You and I look and think, will this thing ever survive? There's nothing left in the end, it's a stump. Will it ever survive this ruthlessness? But he has wisdom and love that doesn't spare. He has wisdom. Perfect wisdom in his understanding that as he stands there being so ruthless, he knows that you and I don't know. This will bring forth fruit that this would never have seen had it not been treated thus. And you and I need to trust God when things go wrong. You and I need to trust the wisdom of God when everything isn't heaven on earth. When everything isn't just prosperity and perfect health and perfect love from everybody, even your enemies. No. We need to trust God when God says to us, the moment I see fruit in your life of any reality, don't be stunned when upon you come trials. Think of not the strange thing. When trials come upon you, God says, these things must come upon you. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now when God purges you and I, and especially me, it's not easy. It's not easy. I wish I could say I shouted hallelujah every step of the way in the 30 years I walked with God. But I would be a liar. I wish I could stand here today and say of an honest heart from the pulpit, I praise God all the way through every trial, everything that ever came upon me. I just worshipped, I praised, and I shouted hallelujah. But I would be a liar in the pulpit of God. And beloved, the day you lie in the pulpit of God, you lose the right to stay in the pulpit of God. Get out of the pulpit if you're going to lie. You're useless to God and man if you're going to lie. Tell the truth for God's sake while you have a chance. I didn't shout hallelujah. <clears throat> if you did, you're a better man than I am. I groan. I've known what it is to groan as a Christian. 
I've known what it is to weep. There's a man stand up in 1997 in this world, in the evangelical church, and dare to say that I wept as a Christian. I've grown. I've grown and longed. The whole creation that groans for God to take me to heaven, away from all this. I wish I could say I shouted hallelujah, but I've grown, beloved. And I have to leave the pulpit if I don't tell you loud and clear, no matter what you think of me. I wept at times and groaned. When the trials come, when sorrows like sea billows roll, oh, it's not easy. It's not easy when this comes upon you. I remember the deepest trial of my faith I ever faced in life was about five years ago. Had you told me 30 years ago when I first came to Christ that these things would come upon my life, I would have been so stunned, I think I would have lost heart. But at some point, God brought upon me such fires, such trials, that I would never have believed God would bring upon someone who named the name of Jesus. Where sorrows just came, like sea billows, you know the old hymn. One wave comes, you can't believe such a thing is happening, you're down in the dust. And you try and get up, and then you suddenly, well, here comes the next wave, the next sorrow. The next tragedy. And you're down and you get up again and there's the next smashing you down. The next. You're scared to get up in the end. You're scared to get up in the end. I remember that terrible, terrible time five, almost six years ago when I hardly could get up. I was so down. So smashed. It was like there was nothing left for God to take. It was like there was nothing left for God to touch. I was so confused. My mind was in a whirl. And I was so stunned that God could do this to me. That I was scared to stand up again. And I remember one day in this stunned, confused, groaning before God, why God, why? The telephone rang and I heard my whole family had been in an accident in the car. And they were taken to the hospital. And when I put that phone down, still numb from all the other fires, all the other trials, all the tragedies, all the sufferings that I've been enduring, going on. As I put the phone down, I went down on my face in my office. And I cried a prayer I never knew I could cry. God, let me die. And I meant it. Let me die. Job was not the only one that ever prayed that God lead people. He was the godliest man on earth. In case you don't think me godly, will cry that from their heart. Let me die. Jeremiah is a kill. Let me die. And you and I will know moments like that. You and I will know moments like that when we're vitally real with God. But now in case you're all sitting there thinking this man is going to bring nothing but negativeness to us, there comes the positive. So grab it with both hands, okay? There's always the end of a storm. There's no such a thing as a fire never ceasing when God allows it to come on your life. There's no such a thing as God allowing the storms and the tragedies and the trials of your face to so smash you that you'll never rise. You may think you'll never rise, but God knows when to stop. There's always the end of a storm. Trust Him. Whatever you're going through, I don't care what it is, I guarantee you this. God is so perfect in His dealings with us. There will be a moment this God, this holy God, the definer with the gold, 
and he lets the fire come on the gold. And he sees the dross, the rubbish, rising. That's all it was that God was dealing. It's terrible for a priest to admit after all those years, there's still things in my life that God has to take out that are hindering him. And the rubbish, the dross and the gold, the only way it will come out is the fire. Job cried out, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold from the fire. He knew deep in his heart there's something to trust. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. There's no such a thing as God being unjust to you, God being cruel to you. God is perfect in his dealings to you. You must believe that. And there's always the end of the fire. There was a moment when God suddenly said, Stop. Enough for now. The fires heating the gold, coming upon this precious, precious metal. Oh, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. The trial of your faith, beloved. Trust God when He says it is more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. This is precious in God's eyes. What he sees is about to happen, the rubbish being dealt with. But there's a moment he says, stop, stop, enough, enough for now. And Satan and all the evil people on this earth cannot touch you. Whatever he stood back and allowed up to that moment, from the moment God says enough. Not all the powers of hell and darkness, not every evil man on earth, no matter who it is, will be able to touch you again until God allows them. Nothing can come past God's command. Stop. In his perfect wisdom, this refiner with the gold, knowing now is enough, now is enough. Stop. And he is perfect when he stops the fires. There's a perfect timing. Trust him. Trust him in it. I'll never forget when God, at the end of that terrible, terrible time, he allowed me to endure when I didn't think I could ever rise again, but God knew I would rise again. I look back and I look at that moment when suddenly God lifted me up out of the dust. Oh, I got up slowly. Before, through all the years, whatever the devil did, I got up and I charged back, I remember. I remember charging back into the battle, no matter what the devil did. But now, I got up so slowly, I'd never got up like that before. And I prayed from my heart a prayer I'd never prayed before, God. If I'm to take another step, it will be by thy grace alone. Oh, confidence is gone in self. Even that God won't tolerate in you, child. He's got to take it away that you know without him you can't take another step. And I pray from my heart, oh God, if I'm going to take another step, it's by thy grace. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to step on in this life. And suddenly, as God lifted me up out of that dust, and I stood up so slowly with all the self-confidence I'd had in life gone. God began to honor me. He opened doors and pulpits that he could never ever allow me in before. Do you know why? Because I would have touched the glory. But now I couldn't. Now God could bring forth more fruit because I knew I was nothing now. And He was everything. Even my next step had to be through God and His grace. And the whole world looks He lifts you out of the dust and sees a person broken of self, relying on God for grace, but sees something they never saw before. God trusting that person. Because he knows now this man won't touch the glory. Not even a sideward glance at it will he be capable of, Spurgeon says, when God dealt with you. Not even a look at the glory anymore, let alone touching it, pondering it. God. Not even a sideward glance at the glory. I remember turning to my wife, who was in this meeting. My darling wife. I don't know. If you'll forgive me for saying that. And I hope she forgives me because I've never ever preached this in front of her. She doesn't know what's coming here. 
And I say it under the blood of our Lord. My darling wife. I turn to my darling wife, whom I respect more than any other human I know on earth, because of her life. I do hope you can say that of your wives, Reddin. I say it from my wife. I never deserved her. And I mean that. But God gave her to me. I turn to my darling wife, and I said to the person I respect more than anyone else on earth that I know, I said to her, Jenny, why? Why would God have allowed this to happen to me? I have served God with every breath in my body. You know that, Jenny. The children know it. The world knows it. I have served God with every breath in my body. Why would God turn on me like this and do all this, Jenny? You know, I shall never forget what my wife said to me. I shall never forget for all eternity what my wife said to me. Tear came down her face as she looked at me and she said, Keith, I don't have all the answers. But this I know. God was perfect in his dealings with you, Keith. Keith, I see in you now something I've never seen before. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. And I know, Keith, that God was perfect in what he's done for you and to you. But I now see what I see in you. God was perfect in what he's done, Keith. Perfect. You know what I said when Jenny said those words? She doesn't know it. I looked at her and I prayed a prayer. I said, God... I would be willing to go through everything again, starting right now, to hear my wife say those words to me. No one knows you like your wife, sir. But the person who knows you better than anyone else on earth to look at you and say, I see Jesus. I said to God from my heart, I would go through it all again, start now, God, just to hear my wife say those words to me. Oh, every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Trust him. He knows what the world will see, what your wife will see, what your children will see, what your enemy will see, that they will never see, never say, if he doesn't have his way, if you don't trust him through the fire. Trust him. Spurgeon. Spurgeon was the only man they ever called the Prince of Preachers. No other preacher on earth was ever called the prince of all preachers. From the time of Paul to this day, one man, the world dared to call the prince of preachers. Charles Spurgeon. Now, I don't like giving labels to a man. I fear labels handed out to men who God uses. As I read Spurgeon's writings, my heart sank as I realized why the world called this man the Prince of Preachers. Oh, I don't know if a man could ever be found that took the word of God and broke it so simply that a child could be gripped and the man of God who walked with God for 50 years would be equally gripped and broken in the same sermon as this man's ability to take the word of God and break it open. He was the Prince of all preachers, there's no doubt of it. No doubt of it. But do you know what he said in his old age? What spurs in the man... It is acknowledged by all preachers as the greatest preacher that ever lived. In his old age, Spurgeon stood up and he just said once to the world why God used him. And I think we need to listen carefully again to something we don't hear today. We're too scared to preach it and too scared to believe it. Spurgeon said these words, If it wasn't for the fire, if it wasn't for the tragedies, if it wasn't for the sufferings, if it wasn't for the trials of my faith, I would be poor as a preacher. I would be poverty stricken in the pulpit of God. I would be poor as a preacher. I would be poverty stricken. 
to man. If it wasn't for these things. Spurgeon says you cannot weep with those that weep unless you've wept yourself. You will judge the man who falls. You will judge the man who groans. But if you've grown yourself, you weep. You cannot weep with them that weep unless you've wept yourself. You cannot comfort people with any comfort unless you comfort them with a comfort wherewith you were comforted. When you were in the fire, Spurgeon says, what burned into your heart in the deepest trials will burn from your lips as a preacher. What burns from your lips as a preacher will burn into the hearts of all who hear you. What doesn't burn into your heart will not burn from your lips. Will never burn into the hearts of anyone you preach to. Only what burns into your heart. Spurgeon said 80% of this book, I don't know how he worked it out, but I don't doubt him. 80% of this book was not given in Old Testament just for historical records of the treatment of God towards his people, the Jews. 80% of this book, Old Testament and New, was given primarily by the heart of God for one reason, to take his people through dark passages, through fires, through trials, when there's no hope, to give them hope. In this fear to give them faith, to give light and darkness, to heal when they're wounded. Eighty percent of the book is dead to you as a preacher unless it burned in your heart when you, oh preacher, if it isn't for the fires, you're going to be poverty stricken to God and man in the pulpit. Trust God when he lets you be comforted in your deepest trial because suddenly you like Spurgeon will comfort them that need comfort with the comfort wherewith you were comforted. Oh, trust him. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, believe him, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That it may bring forth more fruit. That it may bring forth more fruit, God says. Verse 3, now ye are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Are you? I love these words that Christ said. Now ye are clean through the word. Not through the blood. There's that cleansing which you can't get another step toward God unless you've gone through the blood. But do you know the cleansing through the word? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Do you know that cleansing, the sanctifying power of the word that cleanses your life, that changes your priorities, your values, everything in life changes through the word. Nothing else is going to do that. Don't just say it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses the Word to change every single priority you have in life. Have you been so changed and so clean from that which is wrong in God's eyes? Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken, all the words of Christ, recorded and illuminated and expounded on through the New Testament. Everything cleanses you of God's Word. You're clean to it. And then in the next verse comes the most important word God has ever said to a Christian in the whole Bible. There is no verse in the entire scriptures which is so vital, held out by God to you and I the moment we find vital reality. For unless this verse is a reality in my life, then the fires won't do anything but bring bitterness and make me the most unchristlike person on earth. If this isn't the case, you see, this is the vital thing now. Because without this, even God's deepest fires won't do anything but ruin you and destroy you. This is the crux to bring forth fruit. Verse 4, abide in me. Do you? Do you do the one thing that matters more than anything else in life? Listen carefully. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same, bringeth forth much fruit. Trust him. He knows. If he promises you that the one thing that will bring forth fruit in the fires, in the deepest trials, in the tragedies, in the suffering that will come upon you, believe me, the one thing will happen if he promises you and I. He says, if a man, he that abideth in me and I in him the same, bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Trust him, preachers. Without God you, you can't do anything. You have to abide in him. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, here comes the tragedy. Here comes the tragedy. No matter what God does, the longs to be done, he trusts you with hardships and difficulties. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. 
and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, I don't know what that means. I've heard preachers preaching on these verses. And I had to get up and walk out weeping at what they were trying to tell men God was saying there. I can't preach on these verses. Forgive me. I just leave this between you and God also. That's all I'm capable of doing. I haven't got the ability to preach what God means here. Forgive me. And no preacher ever challenged me for saying this. No preacher on earth. And I say it to you. I don't know what it means, but I leave it between you and God. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. You can be sure of it. You can be sure of it. It is withered. Men gather them, cast them into the fire, they are burned. If ye abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask, but ye will it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. This is what glorifies God, the fruit that comes in your life. It is a result of abiding in Him. Now I want you to turn to the same writer who recorded in John, the Gospel according to John. Now he expounds on what Christ said about abiding in Him. In 1 John, the first epistle of John, the first letter of John, he takes which he recorded word for word that we've been reading of what Christ says, and now he expounds. And he tells us what Christ meant by abiding in Him. And why Christ told us that this is the most vital thing for anything of any reality to come in your life. No matter what God does, the one thing you've got to do is abide in Him. Otherwise, there's no fruit. The one thing He expects of you, the one thing He can't force you to do, the one thing you must do, and why? This is in what God says through John as He expounds now what Christ meant. Let's start in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know Him. Hereby we do know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments, if we keep His commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandment, is a liar. That's not me saying it, sir, that's God. You're a liar. Tragedy is you're lying to yourself. And that's a tragedy. But if God says this is the truth, don't argue with him. Hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him. Do you say you know him? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him. Here comes this verse, this word, that Christ said is the one thing that matters for you to survive, for you to bear fruit, for this terrible thing not to happen upon your life, that I don't even understand if you don't abide in him. He that saith, he does the one thing that matters. Do you say you do that, sir? Do you say you abide in him? He that saith, he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. He that saith in this building, that I do the one thing that matters in God's eyes, from my side, the one thing that matters in Christianity once I'm born again. You could say there's ten things, I say there's one thing. If you do the one thing, he that saith, he abideth in him. I'm doing it. Ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Do you in your home? Do you in your church? Do you at your work? Do you towards your enemy? Do you walk even as he walked? Do you walk as Christ? He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. And we turn in the same chapter to the last two verses. Now little children, verse 28. Little children, abide in him. Here it comes again. Abide in him. Why? He always tells us why. But when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him it is coming. Beloved, if you're not abiding in him, you will be ashamed before him it is coming. Otherwise, the word of God is not true. If you don't think that's possible, what is God speaking about? If you're not doing this, you will be ashamed. God says. Otherwise, you're calling God a liar. Little children, abide in him. Do this one thing that matters. This great priority for all God's people. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. Before him it is coming. Chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. There's no victory in Jesus Christ outside of this one thing. There's no such a thing. You can come out a thousand times through your life and weep at the front of a building. But until you do the great discipline of abiding in Christ, you will never know victory over the things that are falling, causing you to fail and taking the wind out of your testimony. Taking away the right for you to cry to the whole world that you belong to Christ. Oh, but if you abide in Him, God says there's victory. Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. Sinneth not. That's an amazing verse from God. Whosoever abideth in Him. This abiding in Christ. 
this abiding is Christ is not an act of faith. Where I say I'm in the body of Christ and by faith I accept I'm in Christ, I'm in the body of Christ, it has nothing to do with faith. This abiding in Christ, every word Christ uttered, every word John is uttering about what Christ said, this abiding in Christ has nothing to do with faith. This is a discipline. A discipline that will cost you more than anything else in life because Satan has more fear of this one thing that he will find in you than anything else he will see in you. He will fight this daily, every opportunity, every moment to keep you from this abiding in Christ. The discipline of communing with God, we boil it down to a quiet time. Without the quiet time, there's no foundation to abide in Christ, to commune with God in a consistent way. The quiet time, this abiding in Christ is a discipline that Satan will fight to keep you from all your life till the day you die, and that makes it cost. Let me tell you, it's not the easiest thing on earth for most of us to make that time real with God, to find God. How vital are you with the quiet time? How vital are you in abiding in Christ? Do you know what a quiet time is? Many people think get into a room, shut the door, read your chapters, have your time of prayer, and then you get up and go. That was your quiet time. That's not a quiet time. A quiet time, beloved, is when you get along with God in your most private chamber, room, perhaps pe people see you there. That can't be helped if you live in a home. But you're there for God, not for men's eyes. Never, not once. Otherwise you grieve God being there. And you stay there with God alone in that room. And you soak yourself in the Word, hearing His voice primarily just to hear the Word. Never open the Bible unless you open it expecting God to speak to you. Otherwise you open it wrongly, even if you're a preacher. You commune with God. You spend your time with God. A quiet time is when the Holy Spirit says to you, no one else, and you know it's God Himself speaking, now my child, you may rise. For now you will walk with me through this day. A quiet time is not getting up and leaving and saying, I had an hour with God or two hours. A quiet time is getting up, opening the door and saying, now as a result of this, I will walk with God. If that isn't the case, you didn't have a quiet time. This has to be the most protected, guarded, nurtured time of your day, every day of your life. And if it is not the most loved, cherished, protected, guarded moment of your life every day, then you're backslidden. If there's anything else that is more guarded or protected or loved by you, if there's anything that comes near the time you have with God, if there's anything, if this isn't the most guarded, protected, cherished, nurtured time every day of your life, then you're utterly backslidden, not a little bit back. You are a grief to God if this isn't your greatest priority in life every day of your life. You measure how real you are by the quiet time. Nothing else. How real are you communing with God? How vital is it with you? How precious is it to you? You can't measure anything else by how vital you are with God, but your quiet time. You're as real as your quiet time. Don't doubt it. You are as real as the time you spend with God that makes you walk with God. And nothing else. Nothing else you can attribute to the fact that you walk with God other than the time you discipline to lay. Everything, nothing will keep you from. You know, my father... My father was one of the godliest men I ever knew in my life. If I have to name on my one hand the holiest men of God I ever knew in my life, my father was one of them. I say that from my heart. I thank God for him. Oh, Daddy walked with God. I remember as a young fellow when Daddy came to God, when he was saved, how faithful he was to the quiet time. Nothing ever kept him from God. Nothing ever kept my father from God. No one, nothing kept my father from God. No matter what the devil did. I shall never forget the first time we had visitors that my father did this to us. That he so shook us, my mother began to choke in embarrassment at what my father did when he found God in reality. We had guests. And he did this through the years. But the first time was the shock when none of us knew what was coming or what was happening. It was always a certain time. It was never a different time. If the guests stayed a bit longer than they ought to, you know what Daddy did. He stood up. And that first night he stood up, shook us. And tears came down his face. He didn't find it easy. He wasn't putting on a show. He said, you've got to forgive me. 
I want to be excused. I'm not being rude. I don't want to offend you. Please stay with my wife and my children. But I have to be excused. You see, I have to go to be with Jesus. And I have to spend so much time. He gave a time with Christ. Otherwise, I can't sleep. My conscience won't allow it. And if I don't finish the quiet time at this time, then I won't be able to get enough sleep to get up at this time. He gave the time. I won't be able to spend the time and he gave how many hours he spent that I need to spend with God. And then I won't be able to walk with God as I know I ought to. The only reason I'll be able to walk as I know I ought to with God is the time I spend. Please forgive me for excusing myself that I cannot miss the time with God now or tomorrow morning. And for that reason, please forgive me. And he turned and walked out. You know, my mother choked from embarrassment that he did that to her in front of our guests. We have to help her to really to stop choking. But I'll never forget how he stood up again and again, never failed, and mommy would stand. And I looked at my mother's face through the years. She stood as my father stood, and she looked at him with respect. She looked at him with no argument, with utter respect, because she knew this is why my husband walks with God. She knew. I watched people, some of them world-renowned preachers in our home, who stood when my father said those words, and I've never seen a person not having tears coming down their eyes as they met a man. Sometimes for the first time in their lives that nothing, no one, no matter who it was living, no one was more important than God. No one would keep them from God. From the time they had to be with God to stay real, to not be a grief to God, to guard and protect. This time that makes you able to not be ashamed before it is coming if he comes today. Nothing else will be reason that you are not ashamed. My daddy was real through the quiet time. How real are you? You're as real as your quiet time. I remember my children. My children, before little Samuel was born, I had two other boys. No, Roy. They're big boys now. When they were little also, quite a few years ago, they knocked at my door when I was praying. And there I came to the door and I looked at my two boys. I said, what is it? And they said, Daddy, it's late. You've got to come. We're going to be late. And I said, but we're not going to be late. I know what time. They said, but Daddy, it is late. You must come now. How long are you going to stay in there? Don't stay so long. Please, Daddy, come. And I looked at these boys and I said, after a little prayer, I said, listen, Noel, and Roy, listen carefully to Daddy. Until the day I die, I don't want you to ever knock on this door again. Unless it's a matter of life or death. Now, don't ever forget that. And I want to tell you why, my boys. I can take you to the homes of preachers across this country, of South Africa. I can take you to the homes of preachers who preach the gospel, preach what daddy's preaching, whose children weep because their fathers can preach but they can't live. I don't know how many children in preachers' homes have got beside me and wept their little hearts out because of the ugliness of their daddy's life. My boys, the only reason you won't weep through me is this time. The only reason I will ever be able to be for you what you would want from the Father, what God would want, is this time. Don't ever hurry me again, boys, or you'll be weeping through this man though I preach. Boys, the only reason you'll ever see your mother not weeping through me is this time. I can take you to the home of a few hundred preachers whose homes I've been in, boys, whose wives weep daily. Is that possible, you say? They weep because of their husband's life. He can preach. He can find time to prepare sermons that stagger the crowds. But he can't live it because he doesn't find time for God. He's too busy with God's work to find time for God, and so his family weep. Oh, that's a tragedy, you preachers. I hope it's not your case. Boys, if you don't want to see your mother weeping through this preacher, don't ever hurry me with this time because this is the only reason I can be, a, be what I need to be to your mother and to you. Don't ever hurry me again, boys. And they never did. Not once have they ever knocked on my door again when they knew I was praying. No matter what came, no matter how late they thought it was. Oh, how real are you? You're as real as your quiet time. You're as vital as your quiet time. You're as safe as your quiet time. I hope you know that. 
I'm going to say something that will shock you now. And some people don't believe a person should preach this from the pulpit of God, but I'm going to. One of the things that has hurt me more than anything else, that aged me more than anything else on earth, is how many preachers are falling into sin across the world of the evangelical church. Do we dare tell the world that's happening? Oh, let me tell you, it's on some of the front pages of the newspapers. There's not a person in town, no matter what town it is, that isn't speaking about it. Don't tell me not to preach about it and tell them why. We need to tell the world why. Why do some of our greatest preachers fall into sin? And there's not a denomination left where some of the greatest and many of the denominations, the greatest preacher they ever had of evangelical holiness churches, not only South Africa, I guarantee you, across your land, There's not a denomination that can point a finger and say, it's you crowd. You're all superficial. Why? One of the things that have aged me is that in this time, for the last few years, good few years, when preachers fall into sin in my land, and also other countries I've been, they somehow get hold of me, this poor man, and they say, you're coming. And I said, no, please. I shattered that man's feet. 40,000 have come to God through his ministry. I could never walk into him and tell him what to do now. You're coming. I've argued with God about it. I don't want this, Lord. And they get me there. You know what they do? Always. Put me into the room. Shut the door and everybody go. There I'm alone with this preacher now. The whole world is staggering over. The people who he brought to Christ in their thousands and thousands and thousands through the anointing of God in his life. Now all stumbling over the man, stumbling, staggering. Now he's bringing blasting upon God's name. The man who will sue you so much that you know the devil's using to what's happening. Fall into sin. Terrible, shameful sin. And everybody's staggering across the country through the man that once stood up with the Bible. And there I look at the man and you know what I do? I weep. I weep every time. I just weep and weep and weep. And then for the first time some of them start weeping. They haven't wept a tear no matter what happens. And they start weeping. And they see someone weeping so for them. And I've looked at these men and I've never ever asked them what went wrong. I've never ever once said what went wrong. I've always told them what went wrong. You neglected God. Or oh, this would never have happened. You neglected God for God's work. And the work of God became sin. Your sin was not this woman. This woman would never have happened. If you didn't have a greater sin. Oh sir, the devil cannot touch you if you're faithful to the quiet child. I can't give you much that I can guarantee, but one of the few things I can hold out with a guarantee is Satan cannot touch you if your quiet time is the greatest priority of your life. God had protected that little never, nothing, no one will keep you from. Your children know it, your visitors know it, the world knows it. Satan can do nothing but bide his time. And sir... When God anointed you as he did to lead so many to Christ when you were with God in the pulpit. I guarantee you were real with a quiet time. Otherwise God would not have been with you like that. And Satan looked at you and all he could do is bide his time. I can do nothing with this man. No good sending a woman saying I want spiritual help but all she really wants is you. No good sending such a woman. No good sending a woman dressed wrongly. He'll be disgusted. No, he's, he's faithful to the quiet time. He'll never ever fall for such things. Satan can do nothing but bide his time. And he bide his time, he bid his time all these years, I guarantee you, until a moment came in your life that Satan looked at you and he saw something happen that he set up. He saw you missing the quiet time. And Satan said, Ah, oh, ah, oh, now I'll get him. Now I'm going to get him. And he got you, sir. He got you. you know what the men do? I don't know one of the ministers. I won't tell you how many I've had to pray with in these last years and how many have fallen to sin that I've heard. Not one did not get on their knees, some on their faces and weep out aloud. God, it's true. Oh, God, thou didn't send this man. This is why I sin. Never until I got too busy for God himself did these things happen. Only when I got too busy with God's work that I didn't meet with God. I didn't neglected God. That became my sin. That's why all this has happened, Lord. I know it. 
Every single one acknowledged that it was when they started neglecting the quiet time, sin came. Even if you're a preacher in the pulpit, even if you're David, who well, God was just to bring a nation to victory. I don't care who you are. Neglect God and the world will be staggering over you. Neglect God, neglect your Christ and neglect the communing with God. If that's not the greatest priority in life, you're in trouble, sir. I don't care who you are, even if you've got 20 degrees behind your name, even if you've left 40,000 people to Christ, sir, you will bring shame on Christ soon if you're neglecting the quiet time for God's work. I guarantee you. I guarantee you that. The greatest miracle you will ever see in your life is not to see someone in this building right now who is stone dead, raised from the dead. And we all stand here shouting hallelujah. The greatest miracle you'll ever see in your life is if you're neglecting God and you're not in sin. That's the greatest miracle I think you'll ever see in your life. Because that's a miracle to me. You're as safe as your quiet time. You're as real as your quiet time. And Satan cannot touch you. He cannot touch you if your quiet time is the greatest love of your life and everybody on earth knows it because you don't neglect it for anyone. You will never neglect God for anyone. A quiet time. My brother was saying here this morning as he read the Psalm 23 to us, have you ever prayed through the Psalms? Do you know what Luther said? Luther said, if I can't pray through, then I sing the Psalms. And he said, I learned something. The Psalms are the schoolmaster of how to pray. I learned how to pray as I began to sing. And not once did I ever get on my knees and start singing the Psalms as prayer to God that I wasn't lifted into the presence of God. I was lifted into the presence of God as I sang the Psalms. You know, Wesley said the same. I heard my daddy singing one day. He sang there and it's quiet. He didn't know I was listening to him singing the old Wesley's hymns. The hymns born in revival, not these superficial hymns. Born when men were dying for their faith and doctrine, cost to believe in truth. And they wrote it. And we sang it in triumph in our belief. As God swept through the nation because we stood for truth and wouldn't compromise, not even in our hymns. I heard my daddy singing. And I said to him one day, Daddy, do you always sing? How much of your quiet time do you spend singing? He said, only when I battle to pray. It's possible you're going to battle to pray. That doesn't mean you're backslidden. But you've got to learn, you've got to nurture, you've got to guard. This is the most important thing in life, that this works. Do what works. Daddy said to me, it worked for Luther, it worked for Wesley, it worked for Andrew Murray. All of them did it when they couldn't get through. They sang, so I sing and I, it works for me. I get through to God. If I can't pray, I start singing and I get through to God. Luther only had the old Psalms, which are rich enough to make us giants with God if we take them to heart. But the hymns are our heritage that Luther started writing. They're theirs, Wesley's hymns. Do what works. If you get on your knees in the morning and you fall asleep, don't get on your knees. Don't do what doesn't work. Don't lie to yourself. Two hours on your knees of sleep is, is wasted. Rather half an hour with God in vital prayer standing up than two hours lying to yourself and God. If you're getting through to God, don't do what doesn't work. If you get on your knees and you fall asleep, don't ever get on your knees. Get up. Rather, wash your face. Have some tea or coffee. Do a bit of exercise, young men. If you find you can't keep a clear mind, do something, but do it for one reason. Everything. Get to bed. Get to bed when you know you should, so you can get up, so that you don't neglect God in your quiet time. Don't let people keep you. It has to be times you're late. It's true. God doesn't... Stand over you and whip you as we heard today when you make a mistake or when you can't, when things are a bit out of your hand. But discipline your whole life around the quiet time. That nothing is done that you aren't thinking of the time with God. Even the time you go to bed. Even what you do when you wake up. I've been an old man, a godly man who was used to win thousands and thousands to Christ. Bertram Friend, in his old age, I saw him walking when our country in South Africa, there was blood flowing everywhere. It was dangerous to walk out in the streets. Dangerous to walk between the out in the countryside, and there in Cape Town we have this magnificent mountain. And here was his old godly Bertram friend walking along the road. All the lonely trees, the beauty of our trees, but lonely. And I pulled a car up next to him and said, Mr. Friend, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm going to Hout Bay. I said, sir, you're going to get hurt. They're killing people. You can't be out here in the lonely. Well, no, I want to walk. Please, Mr. Friend, get in the car. You're going to get hurt. 
He turned to me, this old man, and tears came down his face. He said, Keith, I'm praying. I'm talking to Jesus. I can't get on my knees anymore because I fall asleep in my old age. The only way I can pray with a clear mind is if I walk. And so I walk. One reason, I'm talking to God. I'm in touch with God, boy. You're disturbing me. Go. And I went, do what works. Do anything but make sure it works. Don't lie about the quiet time. Don't say you're having a quiet time if you're not. Don't lie to yourself. Get through with God. Soak yourself in the word of God. But if it doesn't work, pray. Andrew Murray said, ten minutes, ten minutes. Praying that God will bring me into the right mind that I can accept his voice. And be in touch with his voice that I don't lose what God would say. I only, after ten minutes, begin to read of intense prayer with God that I will be prepared to accept from God's heart for me what he has for me today. Or be real with the quiet time. It's all that matters is abiding in Christ so that as a result of the quiet time you don't leave God behind but you open the door and you walk with Him through the day. And that is abiding in Christ. Nothing else. I want every single one of you sitting here today. I don't care if you're preachers. I don't care if you've led 40,000 to Christ. I don't care if you've read books, written books in the name of Christ that people have read. I don't care if you're elders. I don't care if you're youth leaders. I don't care if you're testimony how great it is that a staggered people of what God's done for you. I ask every single person sitting here today, women and men, children, who name the name of Jesus, every one of you that God is speaking to here, you have neglected God. You are sitting here and you know God is singing you out and saying the one thing that matters you're neglecting. Preacher, even for God's work, you're neglecting it. You're not spending the time you should with God. God's work is keeping you from God. That's your sin. The other things of your failures would never be there. There wouldn't be the other sins if you didn't have this sin. I want every single one of you sitting here today who knows that God is confronting them with the most vital thing in life once you name the name of Jesus and you're guilty. And you desperately need to say, God, it's me. I stand in shame and I have neglected God. Even if it's for God's work, I neglect God. I have not made the cry. I haven't protected it as I should. I neglect it, Lord. And I want mercy. I want to be washed in the blood from this sin that has been the cause of all the other sins. I've asked for forgiveness as they come all the others, but this is the one sin I need to cry out now for mercy for God. And I want to vow this day I want to vow to God in the sight of men, in the sight of the devil who's watching me, who's tried to keep me from thee. I want to make a vow here that by thy grace, God, by thy grace, and I know it's there, I will never neglect the quiet time again till the day I die. Not for anyone, for anything. I'm not neglecting my children or my wife. By spending the time I must with thee, I can spend so much time with them that they will curse. But if I don't neglect the time with thee, the time, the little time I spend with them, they will regard as precious in their memories for all their lives. I won't neglect the duties of my life, but Lord, nothing, even my wife, even my children, my work, my preaching will never keep me from God himself in vital reality every day that I may walk with God. I vow to thee, Lord, this day, that I will never, by thy grace, I will never neglect the quiet time again. By thy grace, I will discipline the whole of my life that this will be first, and everybody on earth will know it, that I may walk with God. Every single person in this building, I don't care who you are, that is guilty, and that desperately, not a shallow, superficial, little cheap calling on you to make a step, it costs to admit this. It costs. But think of what it will cost if you don't let God deal with it. I want those of you that need mercy for this terrible sin, and it is a terrible, terrible sin in your life that needs the blood. It caused more grief to God than the other sins you're thinking of. Those of you that need to be washed in the blood for your neglect of God himself, even if it was for the work of God, and to vow these words to God, that by thy grace I will never, ever neglect the quiet time again, Lord, not one day of my life till the day I die. By thy grace. Those of you that desperately need to say that to God, I want you to stand. I only ask once. And those that stand, I'm going to pray for. Those that are standing, will you bow your heads, please? This is between you and God, not me. 
Every one of you standing, will you pray these words aloud after me? Father, wash me in the blood from this terrible sin that has been the cause of all my other sins. Forgive me for neglecting God. I vow that by thy grace to the day I die I will never neglect God again. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Can we remain standing please? I don't know what the custom of your church is. I'm going to ask you, please, if we don't have a hymn, if we don't have singing now, and if you guard your words, if God is speaking to you, please, let everyone try not to butt in. I want you to try and get along with God with as little talk with others at this time until you've had a time to really speak to God alone. And the way you speak to Him when you get to your homes, I want you to do it every morning and every night. The day you die. I want us to go to our places of quiet, whether it's outside of this building, or in your cars, or underneath this building, or in your homes, Somehow find the most private place you can, as soon as you can. You can't be rude if there are things that have to be done. You have to do them. God knows. But as soon as you can, spend time with Jesus. Spend it today. You've got today to do it. Do it. Do it. And never neglect it again. You pray for this poor man. Only God. Only God can change us. No man. Every one of you has to have expectation in God and God alone, or you'll be deeply disappointed through this week. Every one of you need to show God that your only hope is in Him to bless this week. Will you pray for this poor man that God in mercy will guide me what to preach? Each preacher that must stand here and anoint him and prepare every heart and keep us safe from the devil while we're hearing the words. And if there won't be anybody in this week left that isn't walking with God, as they go back to their homes through what God does as a result of your prayers. And if He does anything, it's a result of your prayers, sir. Nothing else, so please pray. Our brother, commit us to God in prayer now. Can we all bow our heads? And then we're going to go in silence. Forgive me if I have, in ignorance, not known the form of order of your service at the end. I do pray. Can you take this? Thank you.